Welcome to our Sunday gathering today. It's good to have you joining with us. Uh, if you're joining from Maxwell Church, welcome to you all. If you're joining from the Tin Kirk, it's great to have you here joining with us. And if you're visiting today, you're a friend or you just, you've just seen this on, on Facebook or YouTube, welcome. Uh, we, we look forward to spending some time together today uh, looking at the gospel of Jesus and we hope that we encourage each other as we look to the God of heaven. Before we carry on though I just want to make a couple of notices and the first is some good news. I am delighted to announce that Paul, our assistant minister, is getting married in April. Paul and Miriam have been uh, together for a number of months now and they are getting married on Saturday the 10th of April down in London. So we are just so delighted for them both at this next step of the journey. Paul says he's not had a chance yet to put uh, a ring on Miriam's finger because of of lockdown, but hopefully that will happen as soon as possible. And uh, we look forward to rejoicing with them in the the happy day when it comes. Uh, Can I also mention on a slightly more mundane note that we have an office bearers meeting of elders and deacons on Thursday the 18th at 7 p.m. via Zoom and more details of that details of that will follow nearer the time. Well this is not how we normally want or, or like to function as a church family being at home and watching online but we delight nevertheless that we can gather even in this way to worship God. So we're going to sing together. We're going to pray and be led in prayer. We're going to be taught from the Bible, the the source of life and truth. We're going to be encouraged to look to Jesus today. Let me read from Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Well, we're now going to sing this psalm together using a traditional Scottish Scottish psalm and Psalter version of it. So let's sing Psalm 40 together just now.
So it's the children's time of the service now, and we're going to have a look at a story from the Bible. And the story we're looking at today is the story of the Sermon on the Mount. So let's have a look at that now. Wherever Jesus went, lots of people went too. They loved being near him. Old people, young people, all kinds of people came to see Jesus. Sick people, well people, happy people, sad people, and worried people. Lots of them, worrying about lots of things. What if we don't have enough food, or clothes, or suppose we run out of money? What if there isn't enough, and everything goes wrong, and we won't be all right? What then? When Jesus saw all the people, his heart was filled with love for them. They were like a little flock of sheep that didn't have a shepherd to take care of them. So Jesus sat them all down and he talked to them. The people sat quietly on the grassy mountainside and listened. From where they sat, they could see the blue lake glittering below them and little fishing boats coming in from a night's catch. The spring air was fresh and clear. See those birds over there, Jesus said. Everyone looked. Little sparrows were pecking at seeds along the stony path. Where do they get their food? Perhaps they have pantries all stocked up. Cabinets full of food. Everyone laughed. Who's ever seen a bird with a bag of groceries? No, Jesus said. They don't need to worry about that because God knows what they need and he feeds them. And what about these wild flowers? Everyone looked. All around them, flowers were growing. Anemones, daisies, pure white lilies. Where do they get their lovely clothes? Do they make them? Or do they go to work every day so they can buy them? Do they have closets full of clothes? Everyone laughed again. Who's ever seen a flower putting on a dress? No, Jesus said. They don't need to worry about that because God clothes them in royal robes of splendour. Not even a king is that well dressed. They had never met a king, but as they gazed out over the lake, glittering and sparkling below them, the hillsides dressed in red, purple and gold, they felt a great burden lift from their hearts. They couldn't imagine anything more beautiful. Little flock, Jesus said, you are more important than birds, more important than flowers. The birds and the flowers don't sit and worry about things. And God doesn't want his children to worry either. God loves to look after the birds and the flowers, and he loves to look after you too. Jesus knew that God would always love and watch over the world he had made. Everything in it, birds, flowers, trees, animals, everything. And most of all, his children. Even though people had forgotten, the birds and the flowers hadn't forgotten. They still knew their song. It was the song all of God's creation had sung to him from the very beginning. It was the song people's hearts were made to sing. God made us. He loves us. He is very pleased with us. It was why Jesus had come into the world to sing them that wonderful song, to sing it not only with his voice but with his whole life so that God's children could remember it and join in and sing it too. So that story is the Sermon on the Mount and in that story it is said that they were like a sheep out a shepherd. Well, I don't know if you've ever seen sheep out in a field, but often they sort of go all over the place and they don't really know where to go. Um, they, they need someone to show them the way to go. So the person that shows them the way is the, is the shepherd, or more often now it would be the farmer that shows them the way to go. Um, and that's, that's what we need. We need Jesus to show us the way, God to show us the way. We're told in the story not to worry well, we don't need to worry. All these things that, uh, that it says in the, in the Bible, it says, don't worry about your food, what you'll wear, and things like that. And I know from my life, from being a Christian, that that's true. I don't need to worry about things. There's some things that I do worry about and think, oh no, how's that going to get sorted? And do you know what? 
it usually does get sorted and I think I think I know how that got sorted it was God and Jesus loves all those people and we know that Jesus loves us and God loves us and and that's that sounds strange doesn't it that God would love us because he's he's so big and so powerful and you'd think well he won't know it about me but actually he does and he really cares about you he cares about me and and he, he loves us so it's really good to remember don't worry God loves us and we need to follow uh, follow Jesus and we need to, to be uh, to let him be our shepherd okay let's pray now Lord God thank you that you are always with us help us not to worry and help us to rely on you help us to follow you and Help us to follow the way that you want us to go. Thank you that you love us. And thank you that even though we're so small compared to you, that you still love us. I pray you'll be with us this week and help us in everything that we do. Amen. It's time to pray. So let me lead us in a time of prayer. Father in heaven, we are so grateful for your grace and mercy and love that you've shown us in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we praise you and thank you that because of Jesus, we are now a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. We thank you, Lord God, that in Jesus Christ, we have an identity that is unshakable, unmovable, cannot be destroyed, and is greater than any other identity we can put our trust in. We pray that you'd help us to declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Lord, help us to be a people that rejoice in the truth of the gospel as the, the truth that brings light in the darkness, life to the dead, hope to the despairing. In Jesus Christ alone, our hope is found. May we praise and delight and repeat the wonderful news of the gospel of Jesus to those who are dying and perishing. We thank you, Lord God, that although we were not a people, we are now a people. And although we had not received mercy, now we have received mercy by coming to Jesus Christ as Saviour. Lord, how we need your mercy every day. We need your grace, your mercy, your help, your spirit, your love, your power within us every day. Because we live in darkness and in a fallen world. We look forward to the day that we will be in the new creation with you in perfection. But help us to endure until we reach that time. How we need your mercy. How Scotland needs your mercy at this time. Father, we, we rejoice at the, the good news of, of Paul and Miriam getting married in April. We pray for them as a couple and for their marriage. Lord, that you bless their, their union, bless their relationship, that they may uh, put Christ first in their relationship and that their home would be a godly one that, that declares the excellencies of him who's called them out of darkness. Lord, we're very conscious and we, we grieve with the community of Cross House in Kilmarnock at this time because of the tragedy of the deaths last Thursday. And so we grieve, we, we are so saddened by these events. Lord, may in some way your peace that passes understanding be made known to the families of those involved. So Lord, help us to, to love and care for those that may be affected because of this. And Lord, we continue to pray for Isabel's family and friends who continue to uh, miss and grieve the loss of such a wonderful and godly lady, mother, friend. So be with them, we pray. Lord, we continue to pray for our world, for our country, for our leaders, for our, our societies, as we continue to grapple and struggle with this awful pandemic that's been going on for what seems so long now. Lord, give us grace and wisdom, and patience, and understanding as we seek to love our neighbours 
And help us, Lord, as a church to continue to put Christ first and to declare him to the nations as the only source of true eternal life in the face of death. Father, your word is a lamp to our feet, a light to our paths, and we come to your word in a moment, and we ask that you would speak to us by your spirit. May Jesus be made much of in our fellowship and in our church uh, as we spend time together. May we be uh, challenged to change and to conform more to his likeness. May we reject and repent sin, pe- repent of sin. May we turn to the light and may we continue to rely on your grace and mercy and spirit. Help us in these things, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to come to the Bible just now. And uh, in case you've, you've, uh, this is the first time with us, or perhaps you've forgotten what we're doing at the moment is going through 1 Samuel. Uh, a bit later in the year, we're going to go through the book of Hebrews. But we're going to do something else as well. Once a month throughout the year, we're going to do something a bit different. We're going to do another series starting today called I Am Not. Last year, last summer, we did a series on the I Am sayings of Jesus found in John's Gospel. Well, this year we're going to look at some I Am Not statements. Um, and, 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 And these are going to be a mixture of what I think are some common defeater beliefs. So, There are some common uh, misunderstandings that people have of Christianity that often stop them from believing in Jesus, and we're going to look at some of those this year. But also we're going to look at some of the key issues that are really having massive impacts on our culture, our our land, our society uh, at the moment. So that's what we're going to do once a month this year, and we're starting today. And today, we're looking at the the statement, I am not worthy. I am not worthy. There is such a strong issue at the moment in our culture of a crisis of identity, of people looking for value, dignity, worth. Uh, There's a lack of hope. There's an abundance of fear. And all of this together is creating a crisis Uh, in in, in all ages, but particularly in younger generations, a crisis of what is my identity? What 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 is the meaning of life? What is my purpose? And people are grappling and struggling with this. And so we're going to look at this today, and we're going to look at, especially at the beginning, some some really quite difficult, even traumatic subject matters. So I just want to say right at the beginning as we're going to spend some time looking at this now, if we look at anything or or mention anything today that you are struggling with, really struggling with, maybe uh, maybe you're, you're really in a dark place, and we touch on something today that speaks to you, I just want to say to you, get in touch. Get in touch. We'd love to help or get help and reach out. Um, so I just want to say that as we begin our time together. And I hope that we are helped and encouraged as we look to Jesus in this matter today. But if we believe, as Christians, if we believe that we have the message of hope and of life and of light, well, we need to speak to those who are really struggling and in darkness. And people are struggling, really struggling at the moment. We look at some of the statistics that are going on in, uh, at the moment, and it's, it's, it's tragic. In 2019, there were 833 suicides in Scotland alone, thousands more in the UK. Two-thirds of those were men, so uh, suicide really high in, in men. In, in, in 2020, uh, there was a rate of 23.3 out of 100,000 uh, in men for suicide, compared to a rate of 7.6 per 100,000 with uh, women. 
there is a desperate darkness that goes on in someone's life when they get to the stage that they feel they can't go on, that there's not worth it. Well, we want to say today from God's word that your life is worth something. Uh, so speak to someone, speak to us if this impacts you. But also other uh, matters, again, uh, the, the, the terrible subject of abuse still continues. In 2019 and 2020, there was 5,311 abuse offences against children in Scotland alone, which is a 30% increase over five years. And abuse is a terribly damaging thing, that, but, it, but it damages really everyone involved. It damages our culture, it damages our societies, our family units. It, of course, damages the abused. They are, they are, uh, their, their, their power is taken away. They are, they are left in darkness. They're left with pain. They, they feel devalued. Their dignity is stripped away. They can feel numb. It affects the abuser because through their wickedness and evil, their, their souls, their lives are damaged. They're, they're, they're harming even themselves as they harm others. And then we have another really pressing concern that's going on and has been going on for the last decade or so. And it's a continuation of the, the sexual orientation revolution that, well, began in the 20th century but came really to the front in the, in the early 2000s. And that is transgender ideology. It's having a massive impact in our society at the moment, not without controversy. Uh, because actually uh, uh, many uh, humanist feminists really feel that uh, a strong transgender ideology robs femininity and, and womanhood of identity. So it's a really serious thing that's going on in our society. But transgender ideology says that gender is, is no longer defined according to physical characteristics or biology. Rather, gender is an existential condition, totally uh, existential, removed from any physical constraint. It becomes an existential exercise. And it has very, very serious consequences. In fact, there has been a 4,000% increase in teenage girls now identifying as trans and undergoing radical treatment for it. What's really fascinating about that, though, is, is that of those, tra of those teenage girls, over 90% of them come from middle-class white homes, which is interesting and, and deserves more scrutiny and thought. But there is a crisis right now in our culture of Identity. Where, what is my identity? How, what, what defines me as a person? Where do I get my value from? Why does my life have any value? Where do I get my sense of self-worth from? Am I worth anything? Does anyone care? And people are desperately searching for meaning. They're, they're searching for order. They're searching for dignity, for love, for respect. And many people just feel, they feel, I am not worthy. I'm not worthy. And they're seeking for a truth that can give their lives meaning and give them a sense of value and worth. But I, I read a great article this week from Desiring God, and there's this great quote that says that in order, in order to live life with hope, we must have a view of reality that can bear the weight of reality. Let me say that again. In order to live life with hope, we must have a view of reality that can bear the weight of reality. You see, at the moment in the West and in Scotland at the moment, a very common view of reality is, uh, involves the following. It involve, it's very materialistic. We place a lot of value on things that we own, physical objects, and owning more stuff can bring meaning and value to people, or so they think. It's also very postmodern, which is a, 
uh, a word that covers a lot of topics, but uh, I'm using it today to mean uh, uh, postmodern in the sense that truth is relative. There's no binding absolute truth that uh, permeates our consciousness and reality. And so what that means is we can um, create our own truth and as long as we're not harming other people, uh, we can believe whatever we want. Although even defining what harming other people is, is up for debate. And essentially, a postmodern view makes us our own king. We, we define our own truth. It's also very humanistic. Humanism is a, is a system of belief that puts humanity at the centre of what goes on in reality. And it essentially creates us as our, as our own kings, our own gods in our own minds. And also in Scotland, it's, there's, there's still a lot of paganism that goes on. And so when you put all of that into a melting pot, it's dark, it's murky, it's confusing. And ultimately, it does not give hope. I mean, look at, look at how much the West is struggling in particular to, to grapple with the, the finiteness of life in the midst of a, a terrible pandemic. And this view forces people to go looking for meaning, for value, for, for a view of reality that works for them and, and helps them get through life. And especially big today, that, that, that something that's going on at the moment is, is a revolution of, of sexual orientation, of gender identity. It's a version of self-identification. But really, beneath it all, everyone, they just want to be valued and loved with a sense of dignity and worth. People want fr uh, friendship. They want to live in peace. They, they, they want to be worth something. It's a basic and strong desire of all humanity. It's actually part of what it means to be human. Why is that? Well, today, I want to say to you that the gospel of Jesus is the only true view of reality that will satisfy your soul. Our worth is found in our God-given identity and is redeemed and restored when we come to Christ and rest in him. Timothy Keller says, Jesus is the only saviour in the world who, if you gain him, will satisfy you and if you fail him, will forgive you. So today, I want to spend a few moments looking at what the Bible has to say of the true reality of where we find hope, meaning, value, dignity, and worth. And so we're going to take a quick look at four points, four passages with four points. And if we're going to do this, we have to start right at the beginning. And so we have to start at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 1, where, where God creates the universe and is recorded for us in the Bible. And possibly, I think the most important text in helping us understand a true perspective of humanity and of our worth and identity and dignity is found in Genesis chapter 1. These words shape our understanding of what it means to be human. And so in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, we, we read this. And God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female he created them. Hugely important. Hugely important. We were created with a purpose. A God-given purpose, which is to rule and govern God's creation. And we were created. Don't miss that. We were created. We are not gods. 
the, 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 the lifelong uh, pursuit of, of humanity to be their own God is wrong. We're not God, we're created. And actually there's a wonderful freedom in releasing ourselves from the burden of having to know everything and having to give ourselves meaning. No, we were created. We don't need to look to ourselves for meaning. We have a higher authority. And he has made everything good. And we were created in the image of God. Theologians use the term imago Dei. And it's, uh, oh, it's just such a powerful part of the truth of the gospel. We are special in all creation, and therefore, by our very existence, we have dignity and worth and value. You are made in the image of God. You are an image bearer of the King of Kings. Do you think like that? Are you aware of that? Do you remember that? Before the day even begins, before you even wake up, before you're even consciously aware again of your troubles, your problems, your despair, your hopelessness, your fears, before any of that, you are worth so much to God that he has made you in his image. So every single person including every one of you that's watching this and and joining in this today, you need to know this truth. That without doing anything, without changing a thing, we are endowed with a God-given sense of dignity, value, worth, meaning, and identity. Your life has worth. Because the identity of the God who made you in his image is is a perfect identity with perfect dignity. He has infinite value and is worth immeasurably more than you could ask or imagine. And we are made in his image. And we must start here when viewing reality as it really is. But we can't stop there. Because although each of us is made in God's image and therefore are are valued by him, we also cannot ignore another event which has left its scar on humanity and, and it's called the fall. It happens just a couple of chapters after what I just read in Genesis chapter three. It would be hard to overstate the devastating effect this event has had on humanity, on on history, on on, on our understanding of reality, our understanding of what it means to be human. So let me read these verses in Genesis chapter 3. Firstly in verse 1. Now, the snake was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the snake, we may eat fruit from the trees of the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not die, the snake said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Then skip forward a bit to verse 11, they they eat from the tree, God confronts them, and, 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 and God says, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? The man says, Well, the woman you you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you've done? And the woman said, The snake deceived me, and I ate. And so the Lord God said to the snake, Because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock. And then follows a whole set of curses, not just against the snake, but against humanity, against uh, Eve, Adam, women and men alike. All of humanity, all of creation is cursed and fallen. 
a devastating event. Everything becomes corrupted. And actually we see this, I'm going to read just a couple more verses from chapter 5, which are some seriously helpful verses that we often overlook. Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. When God created mankind, he made them in the likeness of God. Okay, we know that. He created them male and female and blessed them. We know that. And he named them mankind when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image. And he named him Seth. After Seth was born, Adam lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Adam lived a total of 930 years and he died. Friends, we read there of the devastating effect of what happened at the fall. Take note of the stunning change that's happened in just a few short chapters. In Genesis 1, God made humanity in his own image. But in Genesis 5, because of the fall, all of Adam's children, that's all of us, all of humanity are not only made in God's image, we're also made in Adam's fallen image. We are corrupted by sin and evil. And everything about us is tainted. Our image of God is corrupted. Our, our, our knowledge is corrupted. Our sense of identity and value and purpose is frustrated and tainted. And we've been searching ever since. The fall cripples us. Not only because we come under the condemnation and just judgment of God for our wickedness. But because we are totally corrupted. Our sense of value and worth, we no longer look to the God that made us, we look for anything else. It's possibly, I think, the most important unknown verse in the Bible. Genesis chapter 5, verse 3. And humanity has never been the same since. We seek answers. We're looking for hope. But we look anywhere but to the God that made us in his image. We, we perpetuate the problem and we harm ourselves. We grab hold of any truth that we think might help us continue to be our own king and God. We, we look for anything that might help us find hope in, in the darkness and fix ourselves and fix our problems. But we just can't do it. We can't do it. And people are left broken and searching, feeling vulnerable and afraid and alone. Like they're not worthy. And only the truth, only the truth can set us free. Only the true view of reality can help us bear the weight of the reality we are in and it's found in the word of the God that made us it's found in Jesus Christ the perfect and true image of God and the, the perfect son of Adam who came to rescue us and save us and change us so let me read to you uh, what that change looks like in Colossians, Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. He, that is Jesus, he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Wow! Note the truth of Jesus and, and see how Jesus is the only one capable of saving us from the crushing burdens we place on ourselves. He has come to rescue us from the dominion of darkness and of self-capability. Friends, humanism, a postmodern view of, of relative truth, 
sexual orientation, gender identity, none of those things can ever or will ever satisfy our souls. They will never bring the wholeness and peace and joy and sense of worth that we crave. Yet we pursue them. You were made for more than being identified by your sexual orientation or gender identity or political persuasion. You were made for more than finding truth in any small thing that you can. You were made in the image of God. That's an an amazing truth. But we've been enslaved, you see, by, by darkness and by evil and by ideas and corruption. We've been enslaved by a self centered ideology that ultimately we've inherited and and we are slaves to pride and to the notion that we can be our own gods and guides. But Jesus comes to rescue us from ourselves. And he brings us into his kingdom of truth and reality by redeeming us. And that means he has purchased us at great cost And he's changed us and he's changed our identity from that of being a slave to sin to to being a child of God. And our identity as as image bearers of God is, is redeemed. Our understanding of justice and of purpose and of meaning and of reality and a sense of worth is redeemed in Christ and because of him. He forgives us. He makes us clean. He sets us free. He brings truth. Which means, as we close, that if we come to Jesus and if we allow him to restore and and save us and to redeem our our broken sense of reality, if we allow the truth of God's gospel to set us free from a, dark, a darkness that can distort our thinking, especially of ourselves, well, if we allow that to happen, if we come to Christ, and if he becomes our master and saviour, we gain so much. We, we gain a newly restored identity. We gain a newly redeemed purpose to life we we are reconciled to the God who made us in his image and is the only true source of reality which is why these words in first Peter I think are so helpful first Peter chapter 2 verse 9 you are a chosen people a royal priesthood a holy nation God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Friends, in Christ, know what your identity is. When you come to Jesus. He makes you new. You become a new creation, restored and redeemed and part of the people of God. Once you were not part of his people, but through Christ you gain this wonderful identity and sense of belonging and worth by being part of God's holy people, royal priesthood and nation. You become a child of the King of Kings. That is the greatest identity you can possibly have. A child of the King of Kings. And you're given a fresh purpose in life, which is to declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. No other view of reality can give you that hope or purpose. So friends, if you're you're watching today, if you're really struggling, 
if you're really struggling, struggling, if you're feeling rubbish, perhaps you feel like your life just has no meaning anymore, or that you've got no purpose or point of existence, I say to you, come to Jesus. Because he can give you the only way out of your darkness. God has created us, you, in his image. And even though it is corrupted by sin, in Christ you can be redeemed, restored, rescued, changed. By his son, in his son, we can be safe and saved and know once again what true reality looks like and rest totally secure in our our identity, knowing our purpose and knowing that God values us, that we have dignity and value and worth because of him. our hope in life and death Christ alone Christ alone what is our only confidence that our souls to him belong who holds our days within his hand what comes apart from his command what will keep us to the end? The love of Christ in which we stand. Oh, sing. Christ, he lives, and what reward will have.